16th century, an Englishman sat on a grassy bank near a stream. A very small girl lay near him, staring up at the sky. She had discarded a curious toy with which he had been playing, and now was murmuring a wordless little song to which the man listened with half an ear. What was that, my dear? He asked at last. Just something I made up, Uncle Charles. Sing it again. He pulled out a note. The girl obeyed. Does it mean anything? She nodded. Oh, yes, like the stories I tell you, you know. They are wonderful stories, dear. And you'll put them in a book someday? Yes, but I must change them quite a lot or no one would understand. But I don't think I'll change your little song. Oh, you mustn't. If you did, it wouldn't mean anything. Well, I won't change that stanza anyway, he promised. Just what does it mean? It's... it's the way out, I think. The girl said doubtfully. I'm not sure yet. My magic toys told me. Oh, I wish I knew what London shop sold these marvelous toys. Mama bought them for me. She's dead. Papa doesn't care. She lied. She had found the toys in a box one day as she played by the Thames. And they were indeed wonderful. Her little song, Uncle Charles thought it didn't mean anything. He wasn't a real uncle, she parenthesized, but he was nice. The song meant a great deal. It was the way. Presently she would do what it said. And then... But she was already too old. She never found the way. Paradine had dropped Holloway. Jane had taken a dislike to him, naturally enough, since what she wanted most of all was to have her fears calmed. Since Scott and Emma acted normally now, Jane felt satisfied. It was partly wishful thinking to which Paradine could not entirely subscribe. Scott kept bringing gadgets to Emma for her approval. Usually she'd shake her head. Sometimes she would look doubtful. Very occasionally she would signify agreement. Then there would be an hour of laborious, crazy scribblings on scraps of notepaper... And Scott, after studying the notations, would arrange and rearrange his rocks, bits of machinery, candle ends, and assorted junk. Each day, the maid cleaned them away, and each day, Scott began again. He condescended to explain a little to his puzzled father, who could see no rhyme or reason in the game. But why this pebble right here? Well, it's, it's hard and round, Dad. It belongs there. Oh, well, so is this one hard and round. Well, that's got... Vaseline on it. When you get that far, you can't see just a hard round thing. Well, what comes next? This candle? Scott looked disgusted. That's toward the end. The iron rings next. It was, Paradigm thought, like a scout trail through the woods, markers in a labyrinth. But here again was the random factor. Logic halted, familiar logic, at Scott's motives in arranging the junk as he did. Paradine went out. Over his shoulder, he saw Scott pull a crumpled piece of paper and a pencil from his pocket and head for Emma, who was squatted in a corner thinking things over. Well... Jane was lunching with Uncle Harry, and on this hot Sunday afternoon, there was little to do but read the papers. Paradine settled himself in the coolest place he could find with the Collins and lost himself in the comic strips. An hour later, a clatter of feet upstairs roused him from his doze. Scott's voice was crying exultantly, That's it, slug! Come on! Paradine stood up quickly, frowning. As he went into the hall, the telephone began to ring. Jane had promised to call. His hand was on the receiver when Emma's faint voice squealed with excitement. Paradine grimaced. What the devil was going on upstairs? Scott shrieked, Look! Look out! This way! Paradine, his mouth working, his nerves ridiculously tensed, forgot the phone, raced upstairs. The door of Scott's room was open. The children were vanishing. They went in fragments, like thick smoke in a wind, or like movements in a distorting mirror. Hand in hand they went in a direction Paradon could not understand, and as he blinked there on the threshold, they were gone. Emma, he said dry-throated. Scotty! On the carpet lay a pattern of markers, pebbles, an iron ring, junk. A random pattern, a crumpled sheet of paper blew toward Paradine. He picked it up automatically. Kids, where are you? Don't hide. Emma, 
Scotty! Downstairs, the telephone stopped its shrill, monotonous ringing. Paradigm looked at the paper he held. It was a leaf, torn from a book. There were interlineations and marginal notes in Emma's meaningless scrawl. A stanza of verse had been so underlined and scribbled over that it was almost illegible, but Paradigm was thoroughly familiar with Through the Looking Glass. His memory gave him the words. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and jimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome wraths outgrabe. Idiotically, he thought, Humpty Dumpty explained it. A wabe is the plot of grass around a sundial. A sundial time. It was something to do with time. A long time ago, Scotty asked me what a wabe was. Symbolism. Twas brillig. A perfect mathematical formula giving all the conditions in symbolism the children had finally understood. The junk on the floor. The toves had to be made slithy, Vaseline, and they had to be placed in a certain relationship so that they'd gyre and gimbal lunacy. But it had not been lunacy to Emma and Scott. They thought differently. They used X logic. Those notes Emma had made on the page, she'd translated Carol's words into symbols both she and Scott could understand. The random factor had made sense to the children. They had fulfilled the conditions of the time span equations. And the moam wraths outgrabe. Paradigm made a rather ghastly little sound deep in his throat. He looked at the crazy pattern on the carpet. If he could follow it as the kids had done, but he couldn't. The pattern was senseless. The random factor defeated him. He was conditioned to Euclid. Even if he went insane, he still couldn't do it. It would be the wrong kind of lunacy. His mind had stopped working now, but in a moment the stasis of incredulous horror would pass. Paradigm crumpled the page in his finger. Emma! Scotty! He called in a dead voice as though he could expect no response. Sunlight slanted through the open windows, brightening the golden pelt of Mr. Bear. Downstairs... The ringing of the telephone began again.